Hello friends, this is Otz, potentially, and today I want to try to help the people that I see on my stream, but also many other places, that really struggle playing killer at a higher level. They might have taken a break from the game and are just coming back now, they might have reached red ranks for the first time, uh, some of them aren't even red ranks, but they still play against red rank players all the time because matchmaking issues. Uh, for these people, it is very frustrating. Uh, it doesn't matter how many guides they watch, how much they try to improve their gameplay. It almost seems like no matter what they do, it's always an uphill battle and the games are really frustrating. The results are very inconsistent. Um, there is one thing you must know if you are in this position that I think is worth uh, explaining very briefly right now and getting it out of the way. And I'm going to be very blunt. There is nothing, nothing that can replace experience and playtime. I could play today with no add-ons, worse killer, worse map, eyes blindfolded, and I would probably still do better than me a year ago or two years ago when I started playing with the best add-ons, the best killer, the best map, the best everything. It is hard to, over uh, to overstate just how important it is to have experience in this game. If you have just a few hundred hours in Dead by Daylight, Please, be patient, have an open mind, um, learn things, and do not expect to beat survivors or killers who have thousands and thousands of hours. It doesn't really matter, your perks are not the issue, your add-ons are not the issue, your killer, all of these factors obviously come into play, but these are not the main issues. It is mostly about your playtime, and with experience, all of the things that you're experiencing right now that are difficult will become easier. Now, that being said, I'm not going to lecture you anymore about that. Uh, the rest of this video is going to be a collection of tips and condensed information so that many of the mistakes that you could have made over thousands of hours and many of the breakthrough discoveries and little things you would figure out yourself over thousands of hours, you might learn them just a little bit faster. So if you keep watching, we're going to go in a chronological order from the start of the match to the end and go over all the things that you should know that will make your killer life a lot, lot easier. Let's jump into it. Uh, to keep things as general as possible and not go into too much specific detail, I'm going to assume that you're very well familiar with your killer's powers, that you know exactly how their add-ons work, and that you have a rough idea of what perks work best on them, what build you should be running. If you struggle with any of these, I have very specific videos on these topics, that I recommend you watch out, you'll find them all in the description. But let's assume that you've got that sorted out. You press ready and you queue up for a lobby. Believe it or not, the pregame lobby is actually a very critical time for the killer. This is your chance to look at the survivor names and associate them with their specific characters and cosmetics so that you can tell them apart at a quick glance in-game later. If you play a killer like Ghostface, who has to juggle and keep track of specific survivors, this is very good. If you use obsession perks and you want to avoid or go for a specific character, this is extremely useful. But in general, just knowing who is who will help you out a lot. You also have a chance to look at their cosmetics, maybe check their profile and see how many hours they have if you're on Steam, and see which items they're bringing. All of these things have a big influence on how the match will go, as you can imagine, and you will be tempted sometimes to just dodge every lobby with good players or with a ton of items. Uh, I don't want you to do that. You will never get better if you avoid challenges. Uh, what I do encourage you to do, however, is to be smart and adapt. If you see four flashlights, maybe not the best time to play Wraith or Hag if you're starting to learn them. If you see a map which could potentially find totems and bear traps, maybe not the best time to play Trapper with Ruin, for example. Make a smart decision based on what you see and you'll save yourself a, a lot of really troublesome situations. But once that is done and we queue up to the game, that's where the fun really begins. The start of the match is easily the most critical time and the biggest deciding factor on whether you're going to lose or win the match. Comebacks after a bad start do happen, but if you do have a bad start, it is very likely that even if you play the rest of the game completely flawlessly, Swabbers will manage to win. And this is a lot easier to understand when you realize that the killer starts the match with a massive disadvantage. Survivors have two major things going for them. Number one, pretty much all of the resources are readily available at the start. 
Their exhaustion perks can be used immediately. Their one-time use perks such as Decisive, Unbreakable are still there. Every pallet in the map is still available. These things are really, really powerful and can be a lot to manage for the killer at the start. And reason number two, the killer starts off with zero pressure. If left alone, survivors will naturally want to do their objective. They'll sit on a generator and in about four minutes, all five generators will be completed. Pressure is your ability to make survivors get off those generators to be able to keep up with the game and stay alive. The most natural form of pressure is chasing a survivor. When you chase one survivor, that one survivor cannot do generators, obviously, and now it's only three survivors doing generators. And while that is a slight improvement over the previous situation, you'll find that having three survivors on gens at any given time is just too much for you. You will not be able to keep up with that ever. You need to be able to get them off those gens. And for that reason, we're gonna go over a bunch of tips from start to finish to help you do just that. The first one at the start is to find your first survivor fast. Waste no time at the start. Obviously, some killers have slightly different approaches to the start of the game, but as a general rule, you want to look at the furthest point from you where you spawn, see which generators are nearby, and start working your way towards them. You want to go through the map in a such a way that you'll have long lines of sight so that you can spot survivors spawning in different locations or going towards different objectives. If you're having trouble, I recommend you try one of these three perks. You don't need multiple of them. Try so just one to help you at the start. The Scordons to let you know where two, three, maybe all four survivors spawn. Whispers, a slightly more complex but very useful perk once you master it. Use it at level 3 and it will tell you more or less when survivors spawn if you know how to use it. And Corrupt Intervention, which doesn't really give you any information, but it does prevent survivors from doing the gens they spawn nearby often and will most likely force them into you. The next tip, which many killers still overlook, is to try to chase multiple survivors at once. If you have a chance to push a survivor towards a corner of the map where there's no objective, or to push them towards their teammates who are doing a generator right next to you, I, I hope you realize that you should be doing the latter. You want to bother as many people at once as possible so that you waste their time. And this also opens up all sorts of opportunities for you to actually make a play. Perhaps you'll down the survivor and now hook them next to their generator. And now they can work on that generator. You can defend the generator and the person on the hook both at once. It also makes them a bit more clumsy. When they're in numbers, survivors rarely use windows and pallets as efficiently. You can take advantage of this, make them panic, drop a pallet that normally they wouldn't have dropped this quickly. Always look for opportunities to do this. Always. Of course, there will also be times where you cannot ever do this and you are forced to focus on a single survivor for some time. And the most important thing to do in these situations is to always look for ways to shorten your chases. Now, of course, this is much easier said than done. It's where your experience will really come in. But there are some basic guidelines that you should follow. You should ignore the really good survivors that are clearly good at looping and go for the survivors that are less experienced, that are easier targets. You should also ignore survivors who are currently in a really good part of the map. If they have many windows and strong pallets all strung together, they are probably going to be really hard to down you should instead go for people who are in a part of the map where they don't have nearly as many resources where they won't have as much to work with you also need to understand how to run tiles efficiently good survivors will always waste your time a little bit but they shouldn't be able to do it any more than necessary there are some great guides that i'll link in the description using mind games is also very important and you'll also find some mind gaming guides in the description so check those out Overall, the question you should be asking yourself when you enter a chase is what can I get out of this survivor? Maybe it's a hit, perhaps it's a down if they misplay it, perhaps they'll drop a really strong pallet or you'll force them to use a really strong item or perk that gets them out of the situation. Ask yourself, what can I get out of this person and how long will it take me? If it takes less than 15 seconds to get something, it's usually worth it. If, however, you anticipate that it's going to take 15 or more seconds to even try to get anything out of that survivor, you're probably breaking one of the previous guidelines and you should just leave that person, go for someone else. As a killer, it is always counterintuitive to just leave a survivor once you've started a chase, but trust me, with experience, you'll see for yourself just how useful it is to just drop chase and start over elsewhere sometimes. 
Next up, we need to look at hook state economy and how you need to make each hook really count and be efficient towards your goal of winning the game. As I'm sure you're aware, each survivor needs three hooks to die, and it is very unrealistic to hook Dwight, then hook Meg, then hook Jake, then hook Claudette, then Dwight again, then Meg again. If you do not manage your hook states efficiently, survivors will simply have too much time in their hands, it will take too long to die, and you will have an endgame situation where there's simply too many survivors to handle at once. A general rule of thumb that you should aim towards is to have killed one survivor by the time two generators are still remaining. If you achieve this, it's almost guaranteed that you'll win the game. Once you find yourself in this situation, you can kill an extra survivor with your increased pressure and then deal with the last two or even try to down all of them at once. Either way, this is a winning position for you. So how do we achieve it? Well, the first thing we need to realize is that once we're in this position, it doesn't really matter if the last one or two survivors have been hooked once, twice, or never. They are going to die regardless. Because you put them on the hook and there will be no one left to save them, they will die even if they haven't been hooked before. This means that throughout the match, there should always be one to two survivors that you should be consistently ignoring. By all means, if they give you a free hit, take it, they will have to heal and be slowed down. If they give you a free pallet, break it, it will mess with their teammates later. If they make a massive blunder and they go down, you can slug them and focus on other people that are closer to dying. The only reason you want to waste time picking them up and putting them on the hook is if you have some kind of perk that encourages to do that. If you're running a perk like Pop Goes the Weasel, maybe even Make Your Choice, Die in Light, all these perks that work based on hook, barbecue and chili and so on, you might want to hook them for the value of that perk alone, but otherwise just keep them to a minimum and focus on the one or two survivors that you know will die quickly. That's how you're going to win games. Another really big component to winning more games and becoming a better killer is to identify survivor perks quickly and reliably. With each survivor bringing 4 perks, you have a total of 16 possible perks that you're gonna have to play around and deal with. Some of them are not very impactful, some of them massively change the flow of the game, and it is very important that you identify them quickly. If you want to follow some sort of method to doing this, I recommend that at the start of the match, you assume that everybody has an exhaustion perk, which is usually the case. If you are not running any obsession perk and you see an obsession, also assume that there will be one, perhaps many decisive strikes as well. Based on your rank, you can also make an assumption that there will be some of the current meta perks sprinkled in between. As the game goes on, you will be looking to confirm, deny and fill in these gaps with the actual perks that you can identify. Sometimes survivors will reveal their perks right in front of your eyes and sometimes you'll need to think and have experience in identifying them to know what is happening to be able to tell, okay, this person just started hiding when I looked at them they have spine chill. This person is very greedy on the loop and he's going for an extra round around it. He probably has dead heart. Okay, this person is walking when I approach them. They probably have spin burst, etc, etc, etc. Don't forget that due to the very nature of the leveling and teachable perk system in Dead by Daylight, it will always be more likely that certain survivors will have their own unique teachable perks. So if you have a lobby full of bills, Expect some unbreakables. If you have a lobby full of mechs, it wouldn't be a surprise to see many sprimbers and adrenalines and so on. You get the idea. Once you figure out the full loadout of one or multiple survivors, you will have a big advantage over them. You will know what they're capable of doing and thus predict them better. And you also will know what they cannot get away with. For example, if they go for a save in front of you and you know they don't have borrowed time, you can take advantage of it. If you slug them and leave them on the ground, and they do not have Unbreakable, you know they will take longer to be picked up by somebody else, etc, etc. Knowing the perks that they do not have, that they cannot use against you, is just as important as knowing the perks that they can use against you. All of this information will also be very helpful in understanding and predicting the survivor's flow of action. 
Survivors are predictable beasts. When they spawn, they'll find a generator and sit on it. When they finish a generator and they have nothing else to do, they'll go for the rescue. If you injure them and leave them, if they have a means to heal, they'll probably do it right on the spot. Knowing all of this on top of the information from their perks, their playstyle, how good they are and everything else you can gather on top of the game sense that you will develop over hundreds and hundreds of hours will let you know what survivors will often do before they even do it. That's the reason you see streamers call out things before they happen and see it occur right in front of their eyes. You will be able to figure out what each survivor will do using this game sense and often be able to do something about it to interrupt them and gain the advantage. And thus we reach the topic of survive with friends. Some killers are under the impression that when some or all of the players are playing together and on comms that they suddenly become able to do all these crazy things that normally they just wouldn't be able to. I don't think this is quite right. You should be way more afraid of four really good survivors than four survivors playing casually on comms. But that being said, there are some advantages that they do possess. And sometimes you will be playing against four really good survivors who are also on comms. So what should be your attitude going forward when you know you're dealing with a survivor friends? In my opinion, you shouldn't be afraid of the challenge and understand that for every advantage that they have, there's also small disadvantages. Take for example the fact that if one survivor sees you do something, they will quickly spread that information to everyone else. This also means that if you fool and trick that one survivor, they will be feeding misinformation to everyone else which you wouldn't normally be able to achieve if they weren't playing together. The fact that survivors who play with their buddies are generally more experienced also means that they are more greedy, more confident and who will take riskier strategies and approaches that you can punish if you are sharp. I'm sure you've noticed also that survivor friends take every chance they get to be altruistic, to go for pallet saves. This, if predicted at a good time, can quickly backfire on them. The fact alone that they are coordinated, that they take hits for each other, that they go and finish each other's generators, does in the end also make them more predictable, which again sometimes can play in your favor. In short, do not be afraid of the challenge, you will become a better killer and deal with survivor friends just the same as you deal with normal survivors. And at this point, we've pretty much covered all of the fundamentals, but I'll still give a quick word on a couple topics that some people seem to still be a little bit stuck on. The first one is pallets. Pallets are one of the very few resources that survivors have that once they're used, they can just be gone. You should look for pretty much any opportunity to make them waste them quickly. But not all pallets are the same. There is a great guide on pallets by Otofu that I'll link in the description that you should watch in its entirety if you want to know exactly what I'm talking about. But the very, very quick summary of pallets is the following. There are the pallets that are unsafe, the pallets that are safe, and the pallets that are super safe. The unsafe pallets are pretty much worthless for survivors. Once they drop them, that's it. You can usually go right around them and get the hit. And unless they stun you with them or use them in conjunction with some other element of the map, they're most likely never going to be able to use them to actually extend the chase. For this reason, you can get them out of the way every now and then, but most of the times you don't even need to kick them. You can just walk around them. Do not waste much time trying to get rid of these. The safe pallets, however, are another story. Once a survivor drops them, unless they make a really serious misplay, they are usually able to just keep going around and around until you break it. This is bad. You don't want to do this. Once the pallet is down and get it down as quickly as you can, break it. But do make sure that you are breaking the pallet from the side that will push the survivor into a corner the most, so that when you're done breaking it, the survivor had to waste a little bit of time getting out of the corner and now it's easier to catch up on. Do not break a pallet that lets a survivor quickly run away into safety. The super safe pallets are basically the same concept, but the obstacle around the pallet is so large that even if the survivor was to make a serious blunder, you will never, ever, ever, ever be able to catch them without breaking it. These are usually very far in between in the maps and anytime you can get them out of the way quickly, that's something you should really, really prioritize. The next quick word I want to give is related to gen spread. At the start of the match, survivors have seven available generators to repair that will be spread throughout the match. The distance between these generators is obviously one of your resources. The closer they are, the better for you as you'll be able to waste less and less time going from one to another and defending them. 
As they complete more and more generators, the distance can be greater or shorter depending on which generators you've managed to successfully defend. Now, some people take the logical conclusion to this completely the wrong way. They think that at the end, when there's three generators left, that they always have to be in close proximity, that you have to keep a three gen in order to win. This isn't quite true, but the closer these three gens are, the easier time you will have to seal the deal. This is just one of the resources that you have to buy yourself time. If you have three gens that are completely far apart, you will have a really hard time getting those kills. If you have three gens that are closer, by the time you've got a kill, then yeah, you'll probably be able to come back from that situation. So in short, do not actively try to 3-gen every game, but do keep an eye on which generators are worth defending and which ones are not. If a generator is really hard to get to and has a lot of really safe structures around it, sometimes it's a good idea to give it up in favor of another that you'll be able to defend more easily. Remember that it's very important that generators are always near you so that you can constantly chase survivors into them and force everyone else to keep shifting and moving places. And alright, now for a lightning fast round of tips that I couldn't fit anywhere else. To avoid having a struggling survivor escape from your grasp when someone else is sabotaging or body blocking a hook, don't hesitate to drop the survivor early and then get that person injured or wait some time until the 30 seconds pass and the hook is back before you pick them up and try to hook them again. Remember that a single survivor cannot body block a hook twice. Once you've hooked them once, you can go right through them as they have no collision for a few seconds and then hook. You don't have to hit them twice. To avoid getting zero kills in an endgame scenario, always try to hook the person as far away from an open exit gate as possible. Unless there are several healthy survivors all swarming you at once, you can always exchange the unhooking survivor and put them back on the hook right after. And this of course guarantees that you at least get that one kill. To avoid flashlight saves, get in the habit of always looking at a wall when picking someone up. If there's no walls nearby, you can quickly pick up the survivor and face away from where you think survivors might come from, or even bait it and see if someone comes if you have an idea and get the hit on them. To avoid 360s and being spun by survivors, try getting closer and going for a normal hit instead of a lunge. Following survivors with your attacks is harder the lower your FPS is, so if you play on console or if you have a slower PC, this is always a little bit trickier. Talking about tricks, to avoid tricks like the window tech and the like, the first step is to know about them. Watch experienced survivors and learn from them. Keep up with the tricks that they come up with. Once you know how they work and what they look like from their point of view, you can almost always counter them right away. And finally, to avoid missing the next video I upload, make sure that you subscribe to the channel. Nah, just kidding. Uh, that's it for the guide. I hope that you found it helpful. And if you feel like there's anything I missed at all, please let me know in the comment section down below. I'll see you in the next one. Thank you.